Hey everyone, Bond here for the Ghost Furnace, as always with my cohort, Nick Pennsylvania. How are you doing tonight, Nick? I'm having a real good evening. That's good to hear. I'm happy to hear that. So it's been a few weeks since we were we were on air last with all of you fine folks. We've both been very busy with both uh, professional work and some side projects that have unfortunately been taking up quite a bit of our time along with various festivities, which are all good things. Again, we're going to try and get a little more consistent for you guys going forward here. And we just appreciate you guys sticking with us and your continued uh, interaction and patience. So yeah, I, I will say we have a couple interviews. I know on my end lined up, but right now we are kind of entering the holiday season. And so everybody's pretty hectic and that's just compounded things. Right. I've had a few interviews of myself. I've been trying to line up. And because of, again, just the holidays and things being kind of crazy, uh, it's it's tough nailing, nailing times down sometimes. And so for all of you listening that we've talked to about interviews, thank you for your continued patience. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, uh, we have a really interesting story for you guys tonight. This is one that, that Nick has recorded and he sent over and I got to listen to a few times. So sometimes uh, I'm hearing these things fresh. As you guys know, other times uh, we kind of let each other in on the stories ahead of time. And this is one of those occasions. I am really excited to share this one with you guys. I think it ticks a lot of the boxes that we talk about a lot. And Honestly, it's just a really entertaining little story. Uh, so without further ado, here is Nick. So I found this article in an old newspaper. How old? Well... Saturday, June 20th, 1868 old. This is from the Public Ledger, and this comes from uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, which Newfoundland at the time wasn't really part of Canada. It was self-governing. That's a whole complicated thing. I'm not going to talk about that. What I am going to talk about is this article. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and read the article. It is on the second page, and it is titled, An Interesting Ghost Story with the subtitle, A Haunted Hotel, and it has a lot of the elements that I talk about in our conversations. There's some skepticism, there's some talk about spiritualism. This is going to be interesting. Uh, well, obviously it was interesting enough that I'm bringing it to the table today. So I'm just going to go into it, but here it goes. For some days past, much excitement has been created in St. Anthony, by reports of the appearance of a genuine ghost at the Winslow House. The apparition was said to be that of the late Dr. Jewell, who died in the building during the month of January, we believe, and who, it was stated, had oft late been frequently seen about the house in the open daylight, but upon near approach would vanish or disappear. For the purpose of ascertaining what foundation, if any, exists for the many wild and incredible rumors afloat, we visited the Winslow yesterday, and under the guidance of Professor F. E. McBain, who resides in the building, visited the apartment in which these strange sights and sounds have said to be seen and heard, and from him obtained the following statement. Go to room 74 on the fourth story and see what you can see. I am not a spiritualist, neither do I believe in spiritualism, and yet I am at a loss to account for the following facts. The Winslow House is a very large building, lately run and occupied by the late Dr. Jewell, who died some 8 or 10 weeks since. In its lifetime, the house was used as a water cure establishment, but since his death it has been closed. And with the exception of the room occupied by his widow and her family, and two other families, the house is tenantless. The doctor before his death frequently said he would revisit the house to see how things were getting along, but no attention was paid to these remarks, which were generally made while suffering from excruciating pain. His wife and family, however, cherished the words in their memory and frequently repeated them to their intimate friends. He, the doctor, did not, however, show himself until Saturday the 14th. Mrs. Jewell had been advertised for sale by auction all of her furniture, bedding, etc., which was to take place on the 24th. In the center part of the building on the ground floor are cellars, laundry, etc., 
and in one of these rooms a steam engine which had been used for heating, pumping water, etc. But all the belting had been removed and the engine out of the years past. The first thing that attracted the attention of myself and neighbors was the occasional running of the wheels upon which the belts had used to be placed. This seemed strange, but we said little about it for fear of being laughed at by our neighbors. On Saturday morning, the 14th, my daughter, an intelligent girl of 14 years of age, was returning from the post office, which, by the way, is kept in a room on the ground floor in the southeast corner of the building, and came through the room in which the engine stands and there saw a tall, slim man dressed in a fine suit of broad cloth with a white nightcap on his head and a pair of white stockings on his feet. She passed him without speaking and came into the house and made the remark to her mother and myself that a strange looking man was passing through the laundry dressed as above and that he must be a fool. This was at about 10 o'clock in the morning and I went out with her to see the man whom she described as looking and acting so strangely. When we went out nothing was to be seen and we went and looked through the largest cellar, a dark and bleak apartment 40 feet long by about 20 feet wide. When all at once she exclaimed, Father, there he is coming toward us, and began to draw me back to the door by the hand, and seemed to be very nervous. I could see nothing, but supposing it was someone who was trying to frighten us, I demanded in an angry voice, Who is there? What do you want? I received no reply, and yet the strange appearance passed out of the cellar within two feet of us, as it appeared to her. We came into the house and myself and Mr. Hubert, my next door neighbor, procured a lamp and made a thorough search of all the premises, but neither saw or heard anything. That evening we again explored the dark and dreary cellars, in company of another man, and at the extremity of the interior cellar in the dark corner found a large towel, cleaned and ironed, as if dropped by someone. This towel belonged to Mrs. Jewell and had been washed and laid by about a month ago. We then came to the conclusion that our visitor was flesh and blood, and that his visits were not of an honest character. Under this belief, both Mr. Hubert and myself came to the conclusion that we would bring this ghost ship to grief by the application of powder and ball, and for the benefit of all concerned, gave due notice accordingly. Mr. Hubert got his revolver in readiness and gave my daughter a pistol also. But that night all was still, nothing seen or heard. On Sunday morning, we were congratulating ourselves that our threats of vengeance had the desired effect. But about 10 o'clock in the morning, our hopes were dispelled by a loud report of a pistol and the piercing cry of, Oh my God! I had instructed my daughter that in case she would see him again to shoot him instantly if he would not speak, and that I would stand between her and any harm. She went to the laundry door for the broom, having her pistol in her pocket, and just inside the door stood the man looking directly at her in the same garb which she first saw him. She immediately drew the pistol, presented it at him, but he seemed indifferent to the weapon. And at a distance of six feet, she fired at him. He at once bent forward, clasping his hands across his breast, exclaiming, Oh my God, and disappeared into the cellar. I heard the report of the pistol and heard the cry of, Oh my God, and under the impression that she had shot herself, I ran to the door. When she exclaimed, Father, I have shot him, he is in the cellar. We... In company with Hubert got a lamp and went to the cellar, and as we were going in she said, Father, I have killed him. Now what shall I do? We looked for the man, searching for traces of blood, but to our great surprise and consternation found neither. On Monday, while placing clothes on the line in the yard, she saw him again. When she asked him who he was and what he wanted, he looked at her in a very imploring manner, and after having surveyed her alternatively said, What is your name? She replied that her name was A. E. McBain. He then, in a clear, shrill voice said, Go to number 74 on the fourth story and see what you can see. She, in company with several others, went to the room indicated, but neither saw nor heard anything. 
This, it may be remembered, was at midday in open daylight with a clear Minnesota sky and the sun shining brightly. She did not even know that there was such a number in the house on the fourth story. When I asked her why she did not, at this interview, shoot him, she said that he looked so pitiful that she could not find it in her heart to do so. On Thursday the 10th, she saw him again when she fired at him, but as he was rapidly gliding through the cellar door, she missed him, lodging the bullet in the wall. Half an hour later, she saw him at the cistern, where he beckoned her to him and told her to tell Mrs. Jewell to sit on the west side of the table when she held the next circle and then disappeared. Mrs. Jewell, who is a practicing physician and a highly educated lady, and myself and daughter went down and could see or hear nothing. Now, my daughter never saw Dr. Jewell during his life, and to test to the matter, Dr. Thomas W. Deering took the photographs of 17 different persons, all men, among which was one of the late Dr. Jewell, and placed them before her and asked her, Are any of these like the man whom you saw? After looking them over carefully, she took Jewell's likeness taken shortly before his death and said, Oh, here is the man. I know his face, eyes, and beard. Dr. Jewell was interred in his wedding suit, and although she did not see him at any time in his life, or knew how he was dressed when placed in the coffin, her description was true to the very buttons on his coat. Several men on Friday night last paid a visit to the laundry, but beat a hasty retreat, having to encounter the attacks of a dreadful dog with fiery eyes and a savage mane, and they declared that he really was a dog, and thought that he belonged to the house, but there is no dog about the premises. This is a brief outline of the singular story, the incredible as it may seem, it is true in every particular. I might add that I have omitted many incidents of minor importance, but these are the main facts. I will not attempt to explain this mystery, but will, if possible, try to solve it. Signed. F. E. McBain. Anthony, March 22, 1868. Professor McBain and Mr. Hubert relate many circumstances quite as unaccountable and tell us that their statements can be substantiated by others who have been eyewitnesses. Neither Professor McBain nor his daughters, to whom the apparition appeared, are believers in modern spiritualism. On the contrary, their opinions are very strongly against it, and they are not liable, therefore, to be easily misled or deceived. The widow of Dr. Jewell is a firm believer in spiritualism, as are a number of relatives and friends, and at their seances frequently held, they have received what was purported to be communication from the deceased doctor, stating that he had, in reality, appeared to Miss Bain, and was often in and about the building. So that was the article. I just happened to find it while, again, I typically peruse through old periodicals and something led me somewhere that had me going up into Newfoundland, New Brunswick area. I don't remember exactly what took me there, but I was glad to have found this story, even though at some point he, he says, I think it was Minnesota, Minnesota Sky. So I think that this newspaper is reprinting a story that first appeared in another paper, which was a common thing back then for these sort of stories to be serialized in that manner. Now, having heard it a couple times again, because I wanted to make sure that you could hear this beforehand, I had a couple questions right out of the gate. But the big things I want to know right out front kind of what are your initial impressions and are there any similar stories that you've ever heard? that compared to this one. Yeah. So yeah, again, first off, I just thought it was a really fun story, man. I would love that if normal, like everyday newspapers still printed articles like of that, like length and depth when it came to things of this nature. So it was really just, it was, a, it was a fun, it was fun to listen to. I'm sure it was a fun read the first time you found it too. And as far as things that it sounds like, like, I think I mentioned to you earlier, this, kind of story 
rings very true to me because a lot of like the tropes that we have that you see in the uh, episode, not the episode, the uh, story here weren't really established in the late 1800s yet. So that adds a little bit of credibility because you hear stories all the time, especially later stories that involve like seances and spiritualism of like this confirmation through like at the end of the article, they say that uh, Jewel came through at the end and confirmed that he had been showing himself to this, this woman, the uh, professor's daughter, that there's some validation through spiritual means. Sounds like a lot of stories you hear from that time. I thought that it was interesting that there was like this like non sequitur demon dog that shows up at the very end. There's like, oh yeah, that's a thing. And they were like, oh, we're pretty sure it was a real dog, but it had like glowing fiery eyes and like a huge mane. And it's like, I don't know about that. It's interesting how they throw some of those kind of things in there. The guy showing up to people at like, you know, up the place where he died, that sounds like so many of our ghost stories. Someone haunting a place. They spend a lot of time. It was this guy's home. And then you have his widow selling off the contents of the house. So that's like a very liminal time in a lot of senses for everybody, for the house, for the family, for the community. It sounds very similar to the to the premises of a lot of our modern ghost stories. So in that sense, it sounds like you you could say this was said a hundred years later in the nine the nineteen nineties, and not a whole lot would have to change, which I thought was my was probably my most interesting takeaway, uh, just from the tone of the story and the major beats of the story. Yeah, you know, what's interesting to me is again. One of the things we often mention is spiritualism and just how, just what impact that whole movement had on popular culture. And so this is going back to 1868. This is nearly 120 years before you and I are born. And this is really kind of those early years for that spiritualist movement. You know, I was recalling, well, for me, I usually associate the spiritualist movement with the Fox sisters. I'm sure you're familiar with, well, I know you're familiar with, but if you're not, look up the Fox sisters. And their fame be, kind of begins around 1848 with some incidents in Hydesville, New York. So 1868, we're looking at, we know figures like Mary Todd Lincoln became invested in the spiritualist movement. And it really kind of, for me, it continues until just after World War One. That's kind of where it seems to start waning out. I don't know what, what took its place, but I think that might be why I think the long shadow cast of the spiritualist movement influences the way we think about death today and about the afterlife almost certainly because so many of the tricks and ruses employed by the Fox sisters are still being utilized today by similar figures. And so I don't see a good reason why ghost stories also wouldn't be influenced by the movement. That was one of the things that initially impressed upon me. And of course, I had to ask you what you saw as comparative because so often when we're having these conversations, you go to something that it reminds you of. Yeah. And I think that it's interesting because there is a, there is definitely a spiritualist element. Um, and just to, just to note real quick, I, I do have someone I hope to be talking to soon about spiritualism specifically to get some more background on it, to share with you folks and for my own education. But it's interesting how the the sh like you said the shadow of spiritualism in this article. It's interesting the context that it's used in. Early on, when you're when they're trying when the author is trying to establish the credibility of the different people in the story, he mentions that they're not like anti spiritualist, but they do not identify as spiritualists. And I think it's interesting that they use that as a point of credibility not of just like religious context yeah i see that very similar to how many ghost stories do you hear it said that well i was not a believer but and i'm still not a believer but i just don't know what i saw that night it seems like almost the same verbiage 
Yeah. And I, so I think that that kind of modernizes it for me a little bit because we're still doing, you're right. We're still doing that same, that same thing. And again, I don't think that that actually either establishes or hinders credibility, but it does establish context for how the people in the story react when presented with things they can't explain. So I think that's that's an important distinction to call up whenever you're talking about how spiritualism is inf- is shown in this article. And then at the end of the article, when they say that this doctor, uh, excuse me, this um, Jewel, the guy, <laughs> the, the ghost, um, when he shows up at the seances in the end, saying that you know uh, the, the the daughter of the professor did he was appearing to her. They kind of use the seances as a, as a point of credibility for the story. So I think that it's actually from, as far as the author goes, I really think that he was probably being very fair and kind of middle of the road with his reporting, as far as not um, judging spiritualism or the ghosts, just kind of using it as, points of reference not of credibility which i thought was actually very progressive probably for the time yeah i thought i I, if i recall correctly it was either himself or the professor whose story he was writing about Uh, one of the two were openly against the spiritualist movement or at least very clearly not believing in it so that is kind of an interesting thing to see kind of this class of ideology within this community now one of the things I need to bring up that did frustrate me, though, and I'm curious as if you picked up on this, the story is very much incomplete. What are you, and I'm, I'll, I'll say why, but I'm curious, I see you nodding. When I say it's incomplete, what are the things that jumped out to you that I, I know there were things that bothered me? So there's there's a few things that bother me, but I want to first say, uh, and maybe this is me just kind of playing my part in this in this dialogue, but I think that it kind of establishes a bit of credibility to the story that there are some incons not I wouldn't say inconsistencies, but there are parts that are incomplete or a little bit non sequitur. And I say that because I believe that especially reading other articles from this same time as we have, whether paranormal or not, that are created out of whole cloth, the narratives are often very tight and buttoned up and they follow a very specific pattern. So the fact that this doesn't doesn't follow that, coupled with how the author treats spiritualism, uh, lends credibility for me that the... Whether or not the events actually happened, I don't believe that the author or the writer was making these things up when printing the article, which I think is important context. So you have the the, probably one of the this is this this kind of gets into something I wanted to talk to you later, I guess. But so one of the big inconsistencies for me is how the daughter reacted to the ghost whenever she opens like the broom closet and the guy's standing right there and she just shoots first. (laughs) It was just like, (laughs) like I just like, I I was, I literally laughed out loud. Whatever I listened to you first, tell that Uh, I was just like, man, like different times. Um, She's really, she's, she's just, you know, shooting first. And then, you know, she's saying later, like I killed him. So like, at that point, she's not acting like it's a ghost. She she and the professor clearly think this is a guy living in the house because they even mentioned like the folded linens and everything. But then whenever he appears later, I believe whenever she's doing the laundry, she apparently still has a gun on her, the pistol from the neighbor or whoever. Um, but she doesn't shoot him because when he interacts with her, she says he seems so pitiful. I believe is the word that she used. And then later she apparently just sees him crossing a door threshold and she's firing again in the basement or wherever she is by the well. So her reactions to seeing this spirit are kind of inconsistent because it's like, okay, well, does she think this is a person? And if it is a person, why is she still shooting? So, so I thought that was a little bit inconsistent, but maybe that goes to how inconsistently people react to these things. So I thought that was an interesting inconsistency. What, what did you think about that element? 
Well, one of the things that, and first I'm going to say, the thing that really bothered me is anytime the ghost speaks to anybody, it's saying to go up to the fourth floor to room 74, <laughs> and nobody yeah. does it. There's no nothing does. said. <laughs> right. That's what I mean. That's what really bothered me. Now, you do bring up an interesting thing is sometimes, like, when did they conclude that it's a ghost as opposed to, they talk about, and maybe this is in part the story is getting out of order because this has gone on for some time, judging from uh, some of the things that are said in the story itself. But when he follows his daughter to the cellar, he doesn't see anybody. He mentions how yes. she's nervous and that she pulls him back. And it's the person passes. He's coming at them. He sees nothing. And then he and the neighbor determined... Well, we're going to make sure there's nobody. But was there a conversation where they said, well, yes, I saw him. How come you didn't see him? He was right there. You should have been able to see him. So that's one of those things that that's a big inconsistency. Did their whole, is this a, a, a spiritualist entity coming at us? Or were they kind of torn? And that's why they, as a, with ball and powder, decided i do like how they phrase how they were going to let everybody know so that there wouldn't be any misunderstandings maybe that's why she fired so quickly but that initial him going with his daughter to the cellar and and not seeing anything which she's clearly reacting to it and he notes as much right and that was something that even the first time listening listening to it i i picked up on as well I think that's interesting for a few reasons. One, yeah, it goes to like the inconsistency about how they reacted. I'm not sure how much of that is him just being like, you know, she's obviously very afraid, so I'm going to kind of like play into it kind of thing and going to react like there is something going on. But then it keeps the stuff kind of keeps happening, so it's like, you know, this obviously there's no indications that he thinks this is like oh just in her head or anything like that. But this does highlight one of my favorite elements of the paranormal, which is the which is the co-creative element that I think is evidenced by how often you have instances like this where you have two people that experience an event or they're experiencing like the passage of time in this in the same time, same place, looking at the same thing. And it gets interpreted differently. Sometimes both people do see an entity or whatever. Sometimes they see the same thing. Sometimes they see completely different things. Sometimes one sees it and the other one doesn't. I think that it's interesting that he never sees it, but she does, you know, consistently. Well, well here's another strange thing. And I don't know if you picked up on this, but when she first encounters, she there's a big description of what he's wearing. And she goes back to their rooms in the house and tells her parents, like, this man is acting odd. And she describes his dress, because I interpreted that in part what was odd about it was the way he was dressed at the time. Now mm -hmm. She, she did too, it end, sounded like. Yeah. Right. And at the end of the story, they say the way she described his dress – was how he was buried. Now, the, he says Those that different things. she was not aware, that she was mm -hmm. not aware of what he was laid in. Well, was he not aware at the time either? Had they just arrived in this area uh, and, and did not know him until after he was already dead? And then did the neighbor say, well, if that's the case, they didn't make that very clear at all. All I heard was that she describes his outfit to the buttons, as they said, uh, but then no one makes any mention of that until the end. Yeah, no, I can. I agree that's an inconsistency that I'm not sure if it has to do with the passage of time in the um, the story, or if he showed up looking in different dress at different times. Um, yeah, I didn't get that impression at all. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I didn't get the impression either. But I'm, but I'm, I'm not sure if they just didn't didn't describe that describe that well, or if they didn't make the connection until later on whenever they were talking about it. Maybe it's hard to tell, but you're absolutely right. That is, it is, it is an inconsistency for sure. Something I only considered now is whether or not that inconsistency is the problem of the author or if anything was edited for space for the paper. That's, that's, that's a good point. It's very possible stuff was cut out. 
so like I'm willing to kind of forgive that as an as an inconsistency, not as like a smoking gun of like it being uh, fictional. It also is very interesting, like you said about how he said to go to this room. It was like what fourth floor room was it seventy three seventy four. I, I believe it was in. fourth I, fourth story. I believe it was 74. It was in the 70s, yeah, we'll so, say. Yeah, it was in the 70s. Yeah, I'll go back and check. And that was one of the first things they mentioned whenever first looking into this article, uh, whenever the author was was saying it. I'd love to know if there is a follow-up article out there. We might well, have to do I a little am, bit of looking. Yeah. If there was, it wasn't printed in the, the this paper that I was looking at because that's what I was hunting for. Yeah, because I was just saying, like, this would be perfect for if this is like a well known story in that area, if that house is still there, if this is like a known haunting that's like still going on. That's like what I think of. Because well, I can again, definitely do not, some legwork on that. We might have to look into that because I think that'd be interesting because it sounds like, again, going along with what you said, not to say the inconsistencies, but just like the incompleteness, we don't really have a resolution. We have, we have, you know, her seeing him at the well at the end then we have the devil dog and we have the confirmation through the seances but it's not like he had any unfinished business that then got resolved like you do in a lot of these stories or who knows maybe the contents of the house were sold by his widow and there was never anything else who knows but the like the storyteller in me is just like oh, i want to know what happened i want to know i want to know if there were any other instances and I'd love to, I wish I, we could, I could have asked this professor's daughter, um, like, if this changed her opinion on spiritualism or, or ghosts or anything like that, because it's, it obviously affected quite a few people in this, in this small area. So, like, whether or not it was paranormal, obviously something was going on. There was something that was, you know, how many, how many, how many times could this lady fire inside a house or in a backyard and everyone just be like, Oh, that's just, that's just Susan. She's just, she's just shooting at ghosts you know, <laughs> or people. She yeah. does that. Yeah. yeah. She just, yeah. <laughs> Don't sneak up on Susan. Uh, <laughs> so that's just, that's just wise. <laughs> it's just good advice. I, I think it was a really interesting story. And I think that it, um, it begs a lot of questions that frustratingly, I know I'm not going to get answers to. <laughs> Yeah, sadly, I think uh, most all of the players in this story are quite likely passed on themselves now, considering, again, this was some, you know, 140 years ago nearly. Yeah, and um, but just but some of the other just kind of quick thoughts I have around some of the elements of the story. Um, like I mentioned, the co-creative element, whenever the father, the professor, couldn't see it, but but she did, suggesting that this might have been something that was just taking place in her mind. But that's then later kind of, I guess the perspective of that has to change when the professor says he hears the shot go off and he hear, hears someone who's not his daughter yell, oh my God, you know? Oh yeah. Like that's pretty, that's wild. You don't like, I've one, I've never heard of someone shooting a ghost. I've never heard of the ghost, re a ghost reacting to getting shot let alone reacting verbally where other people who were in, who were, who were not, you know, in front of it, hear it. Like, that's a pretty, that's pretty wild. But right? is, is that what was said exactly? Or was it that he couldn't tell if it was his daughter? Cause I do know the first thing he thought was that she had shot herself accidentally. That's a good point. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, I think I may have misinterpreted that. Um, but either way, he heard her yell. And if and it doesn't sound again, we're assuming these are all sane people. I think that if I think that if she would have said, Oh, I was the one who said, Oh my God, she would have relayed that at the time. Because again, they're down in the basement then looking for blood. You know, like so they again still think, and she said how many times, like think like twice, like I've shot the man, I've killed, you know, father, I've killed this man, kind of thing. So they clearly think something is happening. This isn't something where it's like, oh, I think I saw something out of out of the corner of my eye. Um, but it also makes me think if this is again, if this is a tall tale, or if this is written not as a documentation, but as um, 
or or maybe it's embellishing actual events maybe mm -hmm. it's this is to be dramatic because again the big inconsistency we keep having is well do they think this is a ghost do they think this is a real person is there some argument about it because right if you just i i don't know i have so many problems with that right now <laughs> i think that a lot of times with stories even some very famous ones you have you have people that interact with entities regardless of whether or not they're ghosts bigfoot aliens where you have people in the story that at the time like we have the benefit of being the the omniscient observers in this case we we have that kind of context and that priming going on of oh this is a ghost story so of course what they're seeing is a ghost the people going through it at the time don't have that luxury so you can understand a rational person being like this is a person in my house like that's what we're most worried about and that is the most present kind of danger especially if you're not someone who is familiar believes in these things so again i think that goes to show the credibility of not just credibility but show, it, it shows you the mindset that they are in so that's why i think they make such a big point of the devil dog later they make such a big point of the father questioning why didn't you shoot him whenever you saw him hanging the laundry because so that, that's kind of an example of the father pointing out an inconsistency in how she's reacting that tells me that they're both in a state where they're questioning what's going on so the fact that there is some self-reflection going on in the story between these characters it just shows you where they're where, where their heads are at i think so it's being presented as a ghost story because the guy probably didn't get shot multiple times. Him only showing up to her the one time in the basement. The fact that there was a devil dog and the fact that it was confirmed, quote unquote, you guys can't see me doing air, air quotes, quote, confirmed during the seance. That's what turns it from a possible intruder story into a ghost story. It's that, that kind of context they're putting, you're putting it over after the fact. So here's a question for you that I hadn't thought of until now. It was made clear that she had not known this person in life. She did not see him buried in this suit that she sees him walking about him while she's doing laundry. It clearly seems to be an intelligent haunting, which again, in episode 40, I made it very clear that I don't believe in that whatsoever. But, but... Taking it at face value, taking this story at face value, why would it come to her? Somebody it did this person did not know in life. This is going up to a total stranger and advising a total stranger to like, hey, go dig around my stuff. Essentially, whatever's happening up on that fourth story, up in room seventy something, which nobody seems curious at all about in this tale. <laughs> why does it come to her? <laughs> No, that's a that's a really good point. And I think that there are kind of like three ways to kind of look at that. One is like the Occam's razor. Assuming this isn't just completely fabricated. And this is Yeah, I'm waiting story. to see how you're gonna razor this one. But go on. Right. Either either A, it's a ghost, B, it's a crazy person living in this lady's basement. So those are those it's it's it has to be one of those two things, both of which are a problem. I'm I'm I don't know. Okay. I know how you're slicing it. Yeah. I don't think it could only be one of those two things. Because, well, again, <laughs> if it's going to be a ghost, there are so many other factors and variables going on that this is not the simplest. But I right. understand what you're trying right. to say. Right. So I'm, I'm saying, ge generally speaking, if it's not a completely fabricated story and these – let's say let's say if we're, if we're using the premise that these events took place – yeah, like this is a thing that happened. Either the either the guy's real or he's not. You know, and that's certainly the dichotomy that the actors in this story are, are operating, operating under. Uh, yes, exactly. That's a much. You know what? That's yeah. This is not necessarily an Occam's Razor, razor uh, situation. That's a better way of, of framing it. So if if that's the case, that kind of explains to me again. I think why they're reacting the way that they are because the natural part naturally you would be curious like if it was like if, if if it was a ghost 
I'd be super freaking curious because it's like, this is a mystery. You know, this is like too obvious to ignore. If you just think this is a crazy person dressed up in a dead guy's nightgown, washing himself in your basement and he tells you to go to a room and go through some stuff you're not going to do it <laughs> you know <laughs> like like that just sounds like a trap again if that's the if that's the headspace that they're in i think that kind of that then does explain it why they didn't follow up with it the thing that is kind of interesting to me that you kind of i hadn't thought about this until you mentioned something about the timeline if these houses were so close and everything and they knew each other enough to like know the widow and everything how would she never seen this guy before and that's especially problematic if part of the justification that you use at the end is that she explained how he looked at his funeral you know kind of thing i hadn't thought about that until you mentioned something about the timeline uh but yeah that's definitely another another inconsistency there's there's a lot of unset for for as satisfying as some elements of the story are there's quite a few questions that leave me uh, kind of frustrated. I think that's the biggest thing to take away from it. One of the things uh, I'll just say, though, is I love finding these old stories. I was surprised at how modern and direct a lot of the writing was just because we've dug up other newspaper stories from the same era, and there's a lot of purple prose out there. This was very journalistic in the way that it was written, and I appreciated that. And again, there's, as you kind of already took note of, there are so many elements in this story that we would see as being very modern. I think you said if you jump this story up uh, a few decades up into the 1990s, there aren't many elements that would have seemed out of place other than maybe saying taking action with ball and powder. <laughs> yeah it sounds very dramatic and i appreciate it i think the writing element again i really appreciated it you're right it wasn't as flowery as some of the other stuff from that era again i think the fact that it was written for a broader audience is important context for the for, for the reporting i again i would love to do some more research on this but i wish we had more stories from this time that were written like not written like this but but had these kind of elements to it because there's so many other stories we hear from just anywhere in the middle 1800s that are so overly dramatic you know even if even if they do have some grains of truth or if they it's it's almost so hard to get through how the story is told that it that it makes it really hurts the credibility and kind of how enjoyable some of them are it definitely makes him difficult to slog through because we have a certain expectation of what writing is like. And, but I, I completely agree with you there. A lot of eras, you have to learn how to read them. Oh, for sure. And like, and unfortunately my, like my main experience with that era is reading like civil war journals and things like that, which again is like tough, even if you like are doing it academically, let alone, uh, just for leisure. But again, going real, real quick back to the to the elements of this story, the reason I think that I wish that we had more stories like this are, this kind of goes back to some of the things that we were talking about a few episodes ago with um, the intelligent hauntings and some of the things Mike was talking about with when people get justification and everything through means that they shouldn't otherwise be able to know. It's so rare to hear a story where a ghost has a conversation with somebody. It just doesn't it just doesn't seem to happen that often. Usually when it does, there's either, like we've mentioned, a heavy spiritualist element to it, or some sort of divination happening where there's like automatic writing, or nowadays using the Estes method, things like that. You get like quotes or sometimes even using a spirit box. But the fact that this guy was apparently pleading with this, with this girl uh, or this woman, it's just interesting because you just don't see that very often, and that's really intriguing. And I wish we had more of that. <laughs> well, and I, when you said you don't see that except for when there's a spiritual element, I think that's exactly because of the time and how they thought of spirits right. and whatnot, and because again, the 
big social thing of the spiritualist movement if there were one icon that we look at now as being evident of the spiritualist movement it's the seance and what is the seance other than trying to get spirits of the deceased to speak with people so that mm -hmm. when they tell ghost stories why wouldn't they have them talking because we talk to them at the seance and everything and because that's not so much an element when people do seances these days the closest thing is, is the ouija board stuff right and that's not something speaking you know seances mm -hmm. when they're presented in film and whatnot are almost always presented as an old-timey thing Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'd agree with that. No, I, I would agree. And, and again, this is why, um, because we talk about spiritualism so much, I, I have some folks I'm talking to. I'd like to learn more about both, because I'm not sure how much of our understanding of spiritualism, um, and I say I say, say that like as in the royal we, um, our understanding of spiritualism comes from reenactments in movies. And things like that, and I'm not sure how accurate. I mean, there's obviously the articles that we've read and some of the some of the stories. I'd like to know more about it, and I would like to know how accurate some of those things are, and how that is still done today. I just I would like to know more about. So that's something we are kind of looking into, and hopefully we can bring to you guys, you, you know, folks, soon. But you're, I think you're hitting on something really important there, Nick, which is the story is being told with the current almost like understanding or zeitgeist of how ghosts would interact it's consistent with that and i think that that doesn't that's not to say again that it's either made up or not made up but if there is a co-creative element and if we are just as important to the ghost interaction as the ghost is that's going to be an element of it um no matter what time it is told and I think that's something to just kind of keep in mind, especially when you're trying to either validate or invalidate something. It's just another element to the story is those expectations, those cultural narratives. And especially for something that is, again, printed in a newspaper. It's not an academic journal. It's not just purely for aesthetics. It's for it's to sell copies. Mm -hmm.